Okay, let's discuss the origins of complex life on planet Earth based on one of the more recent studies focused on a very strange type of archaea. An archaea known as Asgard, or technically Asgard archaeota, that many different biologists believe might have actually been our ancestor approximately 2.2 billion years ago. And turns out, according to the research you can find in a description, they might have even helped us develop certain types of immunities against certain types of viruses. And so, hello wonderful person, this is Anton, let's briefly discuss the origins of life on planet Earth once again, but in this case focus on this very specific type of life that was actually only discovered less than 20 years ago. But first, very brief basics when it comes to life on planet Earth. Today we generally divide pretty much all life on planet Earth into prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Prokaryotes, more commonly known as bacteria, are essentially tiny cells, usually containing no nucleus and no complex organelles inside, but were most likely the first life on planet Earth. In comparison, eukaryotes are much more complex, usually store their DNA inside a nucleus and have a lot of complex machinery and complex structures on the inside. With one such structure, mitochondria, potentially being an ancient bacteria that basically found its way inside the cells, eventually forming a symbiotic relationship. But it wasn't until more or less recently that the scientists realized that there was also a third domain of life, archaea. Archaea, in some sense, also resemble bacteria, they don't have nuclei and they don't generally have any organelles, but they actually produce and use energy in very similar ways to a typical eukaryote, not bacteria. And so in some sense they're actually a lot more similar to eukaryotes or more complex cells as opposed to more primitive bacteria. And well, in the last 10 years, because of the discoveries about archaea, we've actually come really far in terms of understanding the evolution of complex life on planet Earth. Now in one of the most recent videos you can find in the description, we've actually discussed the discoveries in regards to multicellularity, or basically how we think simple cells became complex cells over time. There's a really exciting discovery coming from one of the lakes out there where scientists essentially discovered a potential ancestor, or at least a kind of a missing link, when it comes to the formation of a complex multicellular organism. But here in this recent study, we're basically taking a small step back. We're trying to figure out how exactly eukaryotic cells formed. Or basically, why is it that we actually have bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes which then form all of these multicellular complex animals, including us. So basically, what formed the domain of eukaryotes that essentially contains animals, plants, fungi, and protists? And well, it turns out that there is this one organism that potentially explains everything. And it's an organism that was accidentally discovered living around a hydrothermal vent very close to the location referred to as the Loki's castle. Now, not the actual castle, obviously, this is just a place northwest of Norway that's basically a very large field of five active hydrothermal vents at a depth of 2300 meters, 7700 feet. And quite a lot of new species were discovered living around these vents, including very strange archaea. And so because this was so close to Norway, and also because this was already named Loki's castle, a lot of these archaea acquired names from Norse mythology. For example, one of the groups was named Odin, one of them was named Heimdall, and this one right here was named Loki. And eventually researchers decided to name this superphylum Asgard. So basically they're known as the Asgard microbes. And it turns out that a lot of these Asgard members seem to actually contain a lot of various signature proteins that have only been seen in eukaryotes and never in bacteria. For example, proteins in regards to how they process sugars, or proteins that remodel and change their membranes. And that's despite the fact that for the most part, these archaea are actually anaerobic in nature. They don't breathe oxygen, and technically oxygen is even toxic to them. Yet they still contain a lot of similarities to much more complex eukaryotic cells, but also turn out to be distributed in a lot of different habitats on the planet. As a matter of fact, a lot of these Loki archaeota and Tor archaeota seem to live in a lot of different places on the planet. Some even reside inside animals. As a matter of fact, some scientists suggested that we might even have them inside our guts right now. But as I mentioned, they contain features only seen in eukaryotes previously, suggesting a direct evolutionary connection. 
Now, I'm not going to go through specific details because a lot of this stuff is super technical and involves a pretty decent knowledge of genetics, but you can read about all of this in one of the studies in the description if you have the know-how and are super curious. But it's really in the last five years that the scientists started to make some really incredible discoveries. For example, in 2020, they discovered that this archaea, Candidatus prometheor archaeum, actually engaged in a type of a cross-feeding with different bacterial species. In other words, they actually started to form a kind of a symbiosis, while also forming unusually long branching membranes with many of them meant for grabbing other bacteria or even other cells. And so here a lot of scientists actually started to realize that this potentially shows us how a lot of early cells might have formed some kind of a symbiosis with each other and eventually formed a complex eukaryotic cell where one of the bacterial cells eventually evolved into mitochondria. As a matter of fact, we believe this merger must have happened at least twice. And so here the research basically suggested that modern eukaryotic cells are very likely a merger between ancient archaea and some kind of a very specific bacteria, presenting evidence that it was probably from some kind of an archaea similar to the ones I just described. And so that first merger, that potentially happened 2.2 billion years ago, produced first single cellular protists that possibly still did not use oxygen to breathe. But then the second merger, very likely involving some kind of a bacteria that eventually became mitochondria, produced the ancestor of animals and fungi, but also an ancestor that then merged with cyanobacteria to eventually produce plants. Or at least that's the story we have right now based on genetic analysis and based on what we see when we look at the diversity of the tree of life. And so basically both plants and animals very likely evolved at different times from the symbiosis between ancient archaea and specifically these Asgard archaea and various types of specialized bacteria. And now we have even more proof of this based on the study involving immune systems. And so here in the study you can find in the description Pedro Leao and his team focused on trying to figure out the origins of the immune system by looking at these ancient archaea and by seeing how they fight various viruses. And well, it turns out that we did actually inherit certain immune techniques directly from these ancient archaea. And so here, by analyzing thousands and thousands of genomes, they've discovered tens of thousands of viral defense systems, basically specific genes and proteins that are usually responsible for fighting off viral infections. And using this classification, they then discovered two classes of proteins that seem to show up in a lot of different domain of life, and specifically in complex life and in archaea. And here's one of them, viperins. Here you can see the Asgard viperin from various archaea and eukaryote viperin from basically us. Now in humans, viperins represent a kind of a first line of defense when it comes to viral infection. They actually fight off a lot of different viruses, including hepatitis C and even HIV, and they do this by preventing viruses from making copies inside infected cells. The second type of proteins, known as ergonauts, were actually discovered in plants and also prevent viruses from making copies, but in this case, by directly cutting up viral genetic material, thus making it kind of useless. Here's roughly what this protein looks like in a typical eukaryote. And well, it turns out that archaea have them as well, and they also have an uncanny resemblance that would be impossible to create by chance. In other words, there's a direct link, and it seems to be an evolutionary link. Moreover, these genes seem to have changed very little in the last 2 billion years, suggesting that they basically remain the same, probably because they were so successful and so useful. Which of course suggests that these Asgard archaea very likely represent that missing link and were potentially these ancient cells that eventually merged with bacteria to produce eukaryotes. With bacteria in this case also introducing other immune mechanisms that are still present in our cells even today. But naturally, not all of them are the same. As a matter of fact, Asgard archaea have at least 89 unique systems that seem to be only present inside their cells, with only two of them, ergonauts and viperins, also present in eukaryotes. Which basically means that there are still quite a lot of questions to answer when it comes to understanding exactly what happened 2.2 billion years ago. But because of these discoveries of Asgard bacteria, the picture now is much more clear than a decade ago. It's extremely likely that all our cells were basically a result of a symbiosis between archaea and bacteria, which somehow, for some reason, worked so well that it spread everywhere on the planet. And eventually it became so efficient 
that started to produce much more complex bodies, evolving into systems of trillions of cells all functioning at once and all interacting and helping each other, resulting in more and more complexity over time. And so here I'm of course talking about a typical animal body. But exactly how this complexity came to be, that's maybe not the question we can answer yet. I mean, we do have more answers about multicellular life, which you can learn about in the video in the description, and now we have more answers about how complex cells formed, but exactly how some of these cells differentiated and started to form organs and eventually form things like brain, for example, that's still something we cannot answer. But once we do, we'll come back and talk more about this in some of the future videos. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.